Uh, bells in Britain are tolling as the nation and the world mourn the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. At 96 years old, she was the longest reigning monarch in British history. London Bridge is down were the code words spoken upon the Queen's death. They set in motion events leading up to the coronation of her son, King Charles III. Brody Carter brings us the story of Queen Elizabeth's life and legacy. Royal gun salutes, flowers, moments of silence and heartfelt tributes are among the commemorations in Britain and worldwide, mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Because the Queen was respected around the world. United Kingdom's Prime Minister Liz Truss hailed the Queen as the rock of modern Britain. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. A double rainbow appeared in the sky over Buckingham Palace shortly before the announcement of the Queen's death, news that stunned the public. Shocked. I can't believe it. I'm gutted. Absolutely gutted. Quite shocking, really. You, you kind of always knew it was coming, but, you, but when it happens, it's just sad. Born April 21st, 1926 in London's Mayfair district, Queen Elizabeth was born to King George VI and became the Princess of Wales during the Second World War. And when her father died of cancer while she was on her honeymoon with Prince Philip, the 25-year-old princess became queen in 1952. Prime Minister Winston Churchill is among the dignitaries who watch as the Archbishop of Canterbury confirms Elizabeth's sovereignty by placing on her head the six-pound King Edward's crown. Known for her pageantry as a royal queen, her exemplary leadership, and her public statements of faith in Jesus Christ, Queen Elizabeth even developed a friendship founded in faith with the famous American evangelist Billy Graham. For me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. I, like so many of you, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and example. The monarch in Britain is in some ways the head of the Church of England, and she took that role very, very seriously. Nicoletta Gulace, historian of British history at the University of New Hampshire, says the Queen honored that position and remembered those who served her country in wartime. She never missed a, a Remembrance Sunday when people remembered the veterans of the two world wars. In fact, this year it was, she tried very hard to make it, but her mobility and health issues got in the way. But uh, the other times she only missed it when she was pregnant. She attended church services regularly. And as you said, she gave a warming and inspiring address to the nation every single Christmas. And her handling of foreign relations along with the pageantry of the crown made her a beloved figure around the world. London Bridge is down. Those are the code words for the Queen's death spoken Thursday by her private secretary to inform the Prime Minister and the Council, setting into motion the events leading up to the coronation of her son, King Charles III. I think that this is going to shake Britain to the core, but it's also going to have an impact on people throughout the Commonwealth, um, some of whom looked upon her as a crown head, even though they uh, were living in independent countries. Great Britain recently celebrated the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, a commemoration of 70 years on the throne. Elizabeth ruled longer than any other monarch in British history. The Queen died at Balmoral Castle, her summer estate in the Scottish Highlands. That's where she's been since the month of July. Her death came shortly after an announcement from Parliament about her failing health, leading to a new monarch on the throne who will have a formal coronation, although he already took the throne upon his mother's death. He is king because the minute the spirit left the queen's body, he became the king. It is a mystical thing that happens. Britain now begins 10 days of mourning. The queen's body will be sent by train to King's Cross Station. Charles will be there with Prime Minister Truss. And the queen will lie in state at Westminster Hall. And the funeral will take place at Westminster Abbey. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, it truly is an end of the age where you, you, you look at her career, uh, what she stood for, and how she stood so strong. Her Christmas addresses to the nation, to the entire world, were famous. She would write them. One of her titles, and it's a title that I think sometimes gets ignored, but one of her titles is Defender of the Faith. And here are some of the words that she wrote in one of her Christmas addresses. It was after a year of sorrow for her.
I know just how much I rely on my own faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right, to take the long view, to give all of my best and all that the day brings, and to put my trust in God. Those are wonderful words and almost as a signature, uh, an approval from heaven, if you will, the rainbows that were over Buckingham Palace. There was also reports of a rainbow over Balmora Palace and another rain rainbow over Windsor Palace. So uh, it's like God giving a signature, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. In other news, Christians continue to help Ukrainians who are fleeing from Russian aggression. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, Ukrainians trapped in areas occupied by Russia are enduring terrible hardships, and many of them are now making their way through Russia to Baltic countries. And that's where Christians are stepping up to help. Chuck Holton brings us this story. More than 7 million people fled their homes as a result of the conflict in Ukraine, the greatest mass migration since World War II. And in the areas taken over by the Russian army, there's often little left of homes and infrastructure. Suddenly I heard an explosion and my doors were blown out. I felt a little draft and took a torch to find out what it was. I saw the door was missing and all the windows on the balcony were broken. Many of these residents feel stuck without documents or resources to leave, but now they're leaving anyway to escape the coming winter. And to do so, they have to traverse the country of their enemy, Russia. This 15th century Ivangorod fortress on the other side of the river there marks the boundary between Russia and where I'm standing here in Estonia. And it also marks the end of a very long and stressful journey for hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who have made the journey more than 1,500 miles to this bridge right over here where they enter the European Union. This cruise ship in Tallinn's harbor is now a temporary home for 2,000 Ukrainians. While the Estonian government is helping with a small stipend and other social programs, it's still a tough transition. It's hard on the children. That's why we try to keep everything positive, to not talk about it. As if everything is fine, as if we just changed our place of residence. Cramped conditions on board the ship are nothing compared to what these Ukrainians endured to get here. They surrounded me with their weapons and said, you do not get to choose where you will go. We choose. And I said, sorry, but we are not cattle. We are humans. This tiny Baltic nation has taken in more than 50,000 refugees since the beginning of the war. It's about three, four percent of the population that has um, come to Estonia as refugees. And we're not even counting the people who have just come through, you know, for context. That's about, about 10 million people in the United States. 79-year-old Zoya never traveled more than a few miles from her home in Mariupol before it was bombed by the Russians. Now we have nowhere else to go. What's worse, we have no electricity, no gas. I doubt we'll have heat this winter. After Zoya arrived here with little more than the clothes on her back, local church members volunteered to take her in. And the people at our church wanted to see if anybody would be able to help her out, put her up for a couple of nights, and we, we figured we might, might as well do that. I am so grateful for this family. How can they treat me so well when we aren't even family? We did not ask for Russia to save us. Maybe 5% of the people in Mariupol supported the Russians. But you'd have to be on drugs to look at these blackened, bombed out buildings and think that this is what it looks like to be saved. Ukrainians aren't the only ones crossing into Estonia in search of a better future. There are thousands of Russians here as well. Like, I immigrated from Russia in 2015, and one of the reasons I immigrated was that, like, I felt that I'm growing up or uh, living in a country of aggressor. I think this war should not have happened. We just broke into our neighbors and started killing them for no reason. These things should not happen in the 21st century. In Tallinn, Estonia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Turning now to the Middle East, for the first time, Israeli archaeologists have uncovered rare pieces of ivory from the Old Testament era of Israel's first temple. As Julie Stahl reports from Jerusalem, it provides more clues about what life was like during that ancient time. 
These decorative pieces help experts continue to put together the historic puzzle of Jerusalem from more than 2,500 years ago. We found a complete corpus of uh, small ivory plates inlays that used to decorate large wooden furnitures, uh, for example, beds or doors or something like that. It's the first time that are found here in Jerusalem or in Judea. The discovery of some 1,500 tiny pieces happened at the sprawling City of David dig site in the ruins of a large palatial building that would have been in use as far back as 800 B.C. And it means that Jerusalem was an important city, that the elite of Jerusalem were people of high rank, important enough to communicate with their peers at the elite of Assyria and other places in the empire. Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Yiftak Shalev says the items were most likely made outside of Israel. It's a very delicate art. You need to remember that ivory is most probably one of the most prestige and most expensive items in the world, more expensive than gold. And only few people knew how to work with it. Shalev says it's not clear how the ivory pieces arrived in Jerusalem. They might come as part of trade or even more likely came as gift between peer politic interaction. Maybe one of the elite families in Assyria gave these as gift for the local elites or something like that. Shalev says the structure where the tiny fragments were discovered is historic in its own right. We're digging one of the largest structures from the first temple period ever to be found in Jerusalem. It had two stories. We found the house destroyed. It was burnt in huge fire most probably during the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian in 586 B.C. Archaeologists also found seals in 15 broken jars that contained wine spiced with vanilla. Given these discoveries, Shalev says, it's clear the residents were part of elite Jerusalem and well-connected to the royal family. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the City of David, Jerusalem. These finds are always exciting, Gordon. It's always wonderful to see the Bible come to life, that the record of the Bible is literally written in stone. And this case, written in ivory. The Bible says that uh, King Solomon had a throne of ivory. Uh, it's well known that they, they ate on couches. They reclined for dinner. And to find the ivory remnants of that furniture is really incredible. Kirk Cameron's latest movie opens in theaters today. Life Mark is based on a true story that deals with an issue very close to Kirk's heart, choosing adoption, not abortion. CBN's Billy Hollowell talked with Kirk and director Stephen Kendrick about the power of this film to move audiences and motivate them to action. God gave you to me and mom as a gift, and you will always be our son. I've always wondered if my biological parents think about me. You want to talk to him? I don't think he'd want to talk to me. There's only one way to find out. Is that your birth mom? She wants to meet. Life Mark, a new movie based on an incredible true story that celebrates the gift of life, comes from executive producers Kirk Cameron and the Kendrick brothers. Cameron believes the timing of the film's release on the heels of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark abortion ruling is God-ordained. This is a movie that is coming out at an unbelievably providential moment in history. I mean, who would have thought that Roe v. Wade would be gone? Like, think, let's say that again. Roe v. Wade is gone. Holy smokes. And now here's a movie that's coming on the heels of that Supreme Court decision that celebrates the value of life in the womb and the beauty of adoption. LifeMark tells the story of 18-year-old David, whose comfortable world is tossed into chaos when his birth mom surprisingly reaches out to meet him. With his adoptive parents' support, David embarks on an inspirational journey to discover truths about his past. LifeMark highlights and celebrates the true power of adoption. It's just a story that is full of heart and humor and action and adventure, and you see the impact that one life can have on so many. We it's also a deeply personal story for Cameron and for his family. Now, I'm passionate about this because I have four adopted children. My wife, Chelsea, and I, uh, we met and got married on the set of Growing Pains. We started this great big family by adopting our kids. Why did we do that? Well, my wife is herself an adopted child. 
so think about this. My wife was one doctor appointment away from not existing. And our four children were also this close to not existing. And if my wife hadn't been born, either would our two natural born children. So all six of our kids and my wife wouldn't be here if people didn't value their life while they were in the womb so that they could grow into these beautiful, amazing people that they are. It's stories like Cameron's that executive producer Stephen Kendrick wants Christians to ponder more deeply as they confront abortion and live out the gospel. I think the pro-life message that is beautifully interwoven into the story is really packaged in a beautiful adoption story. And I think the church has an amazing opportunity in our generation to not only support women in crisis pregnancies, but we need to practice what James 1.27 says, that pure religion is to also take care of the widows and the orphans. And having been an adopted father and seeing how amazing that can be, and knowing that God's heart is for the orphan, we're spiritually adopted when we place our faith in Christ. I think the church has an amazing opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our generation by reaching out and supporting adoption. A lot of Christians adopt. You know, Christian adoption rate is higher than the, the general public, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and most Christians are not adopting. So, you know, what's your hope for the film when it comes to that particular facet of the life discussion? This is a movie that is going to touch your heart in so many different ways. It's a three or four Kleenex movie. Um, it's, I mean, that's not a spoiler alert. It's just a little bit of a warning. You are going to be uh, moved very deeply and you're gonna be inspired to action. Uh, I, I think this is uh, uh, one of those Kairos moments in the, 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 in the history of the family of faith here in America particularly, where we have an opportunity to uh, do like God and embrace the subject of adoption because I think it is the answer to the horrors of abortion. LifeMark offers a powerful call to live out Christ's command to love God and love others while also exploring the gift of adoption for children and families alike. This is Billy Hollowell for CBN News. This is a moment for the church to absolutely shine. Uh, so take, take this movie to heart. It opens in theaters today in a limited release Fathom event. To find out where it's planning in your area and to buy tickets, all you have to do is go to cbnnews.com. A tracheostomy, a feeding tube, and dialysis. Doctors said advanced life support was Rusty's only hope of survival. It was an excruciating decision for his wife, Annette. So during this darkest of times, she continued to cling to the promises of God and to the power of prayer. He got on the phone. He was very weak. It was horrible because I didn't know if that would be the last time I'd ever speak to him. In late July 2021, a carefree summer came to an abrupt halt when Annette and Rusty Beggarly contracted COVID-19. Annette recovered quickly. Rusty did not. By August 5th, he was in ICU at Lynchburg General Hospital. They called me and they said, he was going to be put on a ventilator and he would be in ICU. And it was terrifying because I had heard so many stories of people who went into ICU and never came back. Annette asked to speak to her husband on the phone. I told him I loved him. I kept telling him I loved him. I didn't want to do this life without him. Over the next week, Rusty continued to worsen. Annette's Father church Jesus rallied God. around her in 24-7 prayer. I knew they had our back, that they were praying, that they were standing in for me. Annette believed that God would heal her husband, yet she faced the stark reality that he might not. I had to surrender everything to God, and if you choose for him to live, we'll praise you forever for it. But if you choose not to bring him back, we will yet serve you. By the end of two weeks, Rusty had declined even further as he developed severe acute respiratory syndrome known as SARS. I would pray, meditate, you know, praise God. And I got his wedding band and I anointed it with oil. I would read and when I would get to a point where God was giving me a promise, I would set that wedding band in that spot on my Bible. 
There was one positive development during that time. On August 16th, Rusty was declared COVID free. It also happened to be the couple's 35th wedding anniversary, and Annette could be there with her beloved husband. Their reunion, however, was bittersweet. So I went through the door. He was very swollen. He's totally sedated. I stood by his side and, and told in his hand. <laughs> I was just so filled with compassion for him. Every day in the coming weeks, Annette would drive two hours to visit Rusty. Holding on to hope was getting harder. He would look a little more agitated, a little more swollen. I talked to him, even though he didn't look like he could understand me, but it was horrifying because I didn't know if he had brain damage. Then Rusty's organs began shutting down. The beggarly son, Russell, is the nursing director of a COVID unit at a nearby hospital. He knew his dad was dying. It, it was incredibly grim, and I'd seen a lot of cases similar to this that had bad outcomes, that they did not survive. So I did not have a lot of hope that he was going to recover. Doctors now said it was time to make a decision whether or not to put Rusty on advanced life support, which meant a tracheostomy, a feeding tube, and dialysis. It was the most excruciating decision I have ever made in my life. They said he might die, he might live, but he had a 50% chance to live, and I had to give him that chance to live. After several days, Rusty still showed no signs of recovery. Annette pressed on, held up by the prayers of her family and their church. It was not a good prospect that he was gonna live when everything looked completely dark and bleak. I held on to those promises God gave me and I would say repeatedly, God, I trust you with this. Then on September 19th, 2021, Annette, as usual, came to see her husband. This time, up in the bed, fully cognizant, totally aware, smiling at me, talking to me, and I'm like, Jesus, he has been resurrected. I was elated. It was so wonderful. To finally get to see her, just to look on her face, I mean, it just, it, it was, it was wonderful. It, it was amazing for me to see that. And mentally, you know, he's there again, he's talking to us. It was, it was a miracle. Rusty was overwhelmed with gratitude to God and for the people who prayed him back to life. It makes me realize how much God does love me. All the prayers, all the cards, all the texts, just, I cried and that special woman he calls his wife. I never realized what you know, she was willing to go through uh, for me. It just awes me, you know, her, for how much faith she had. After four more weeks at the long-term acute care facility, Rusty went home. Five months later, Rusty was back at work with no physical disabilities. He stays busy making up for lost time with Annette and his family. I will never cease to thank God for that day and the fact that he gave me my husband back. That's one of those things that's it's been amazing to me to see that he does still do miracles. So I'm blessed every day that I get up. Every day I'm still breathing, I'm still walking. It really makes me feel good. I mean, just people see me knowing how close I was to dying and that he, he brought me right back. Grasp onto those promises you get out of the Word of God and never let them go. For one thing, I'm living proof that God will heal people. Pray. There is exponential power in prayer. So much power in prayer. Don't give up. You know, staying in the Word, staying amongst praying friends is what keeps you in times like this. I love what Rusty's son said. I, I realize God still does miracles today. God does do miracles today. God does respond to our prayers. One of the reasons we celebrate a week of prayer every year is to just honor that quality in our Lord, that he hears us when we pray, he knows our need, he knows our names. And so today we want to take some time to pray for all of you. Many of you have sent in prayer requests. I'll read a few and Gordon, you have some as well, but this comes in asking for healing for a severe toe infection to prevent amputation. Someone 
someone else saying, I need to be healed of a hernia. And then this person saying, strength to declutter my house has been a huge issue for me for way too long. So wanting to just get their life in order. And then someone saying, for continued strength and comfort for my sister-in-law and nieces and nephews since my brother's death. You know, God says he collects our tears in his bottle. He knows us, Gordon. Here's one uh, request to be healed of leukemia, mm. healing of my eyes from macular degeneration, to be released from bipolar disease and depression, and then uh, all my children be able to discern the leading of the Holy Spirit and walk in their God-given identity. Mm. These are wonderful requests. We have had thousands of them. If you want to join in and have your prayer request prayed over. The staff of CBN is gathering. Uh, people are gathering together. We're praying on this show. We have a noon prayer chapel. We want to pray for you. So if you want your prayer request included, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we lift these requests to you, all the ones who have written in, all the ones who have called in, all the ones that have left prayer requests in comment sections or texted prayers, Lord, we lift them all to you. And we know that you are the answer to every human need. We know that you are God Almighty. We know that you are able. So we come to you believing and declaring I shall not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord, the great things that God has done for me. I will stand in the assembly and declare that God works miracles. He heals all my diseases. He forgives all my iniquities. He loves me as his only child. He loves me. So, Lord, stretch forth your hand and do signs and wonders. These signs shall follow them that believe. And so we believe, and now the signs will follow. Our healing will manifest now in Jesus' name. There's someone you have extreme arthritis, and it's primarily in your right hand. And I'm just seeing that your hand is, has been turned almost to a, to a claw, and it. It just, um, it, it's very painful for you to stretch your fingers. I don't know if there's some partial paralysis that goes with it. Uh, and, and, you know, is there some kind of effect of a stroke or, 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 or what the overall issue is? I'm just seeing your hand. And life is coming into it now. Feeling is coming into it. Mobility in your fingers is coming into it right now. In the name of Jesus, stretch forth your hand. You're feeling it now. New life, new mobility, new function into that hand. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Terry? There's someone else. You have an issue with your tongue. I don't know if it's cancer, but you're, you've been told you need to have surgery on it. You have this great fear that you're going to go to sleep and wake up and not be able to speak again. God has gone before you. The surgery is going to go well. Your speech is going to be fine, and you're going to be healed from this condition. In Jesus' name, receive that word. Um, to let you know that this is really for you, there's a tumor uh, as well on the, on, there's, there's, something has gone into your tongue, but there's also a tumor on the right side behind the right jaw. God is healing that. He's dissolving that tumor in Jesus' name. Be healed, be made whole. Now, someone else suffering just came on kind of suddenly, mental confusion, and it's so frustrating to you. You know that you have it, you can't seem to get it in order. Just lift up your hands right now and begin to praise the Lord as he just sets you free from that. All things back in order, total restoration in Jesus' name. Someone you have macular degeneration is primarily in the left eye. Uh, it started with flashes of light, but now you're having um, just sort of dark spots and, and you're, you're really afraid of losing your vision. God is healing your eye. He is uh, reattaching your retina. Everything concerning your vision is being restored right now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Someone with a stomach abscess, 
um, serious stomach abscess. You're going to feel a warmth come over your abdomen right now as Jesus heals what medicine has not been able to heal for you. Receive that and begin to thank the Lord. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the things that you do for us, how you always mm -hmm. leave the 99 to come for the one. Thank we thank you that you love us so much that you come for each one of us. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen. Well, if you've been healed, if you've been touched, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Today, we're continuing our seven days ablaze week of prayer. And so join our live stream chapel service. We'll be praying for your personal requests at CBN dot com at noon Eastern. It's also available in the CBM Family app. We'll also be posting it on YouTube. So a lot of different ways you can join with us. Remember also, you can call us 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you want prayer. 1-800-700-7000 or you can go to CBN.com. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. A new Illinois law set to go into effect next year will do away with the state's cash bail system. So suspects charged with felonies, including second degree murder, aggravated battery and arson will be released without bail. Supporters say the cash bail system is not fair to poor defendants, but police and prosecutors are sounding the alarm. Will County State's Attorney James Glasgow warns the hands of officers, lawyers and judges will be tied. And he says, quote, what you see in Chicago we'll have here. You can find out more about the controversy at CBNnews.com. CBN's Operation Blessing has helped people in Kentucky recover from the devastating floods earlier this year. Many lost not only their personal items, but also kitchen appliances, refrigerators, and food. That meant that the families went through days without meals and had to rely on outside help to feed their children. Thanks to support from its partners, Operation Blessing teams prepared and delivered thousands of meals to those in needy areas hit by that flooding. Operation Blessing's goal was not just to send a dinner, but to also provide a hearty, tasty, nutritious meal. And the teams delivered cases of fresh water to people who needed it. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. What if you were to think of the conflict in your life as a calling rather than a mistake, as an opportunity instead of opposition, and as a purpose rather than a problem? That's the challenge that Jonathan Evans poses in his new book, Fighting Your Battles. Jonathan Evans is an author, speaker, and chaplain for both the Dallas Cowboys and Dallas Mavericks. The son of well-known pastor Dr. Tony Evans, he's a husband and father of five himself. Jonathan knows firsthand that life is full of spiritual battles. Illness, injury, miscarriage, and the death of loved ones have all left their marks on his life. Fighting Your Battles is Jonathan's new playbook for victory in the darkest times of our lives. Let's go. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Jonathan Evans. Jonathan, great to have you with us again. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, everybody has battles and challenges in their lives. Your book is written from a very personal experience. Let's start with your mom's cancer journey. I know your family well enough to know that you all were praying and believing for healing. How did her death and that journey test your faith and become a testimony for you and the family? Well, definitely. It's a great question. I mean, when you're praying, I mean, we had people walking around our house like the walls of Jericho trying to knock the cancer down. People praying um, all over the uh, not only the uh, city and state, but also uh, the world. And so we just believed that what the word said and we knew all the scriptures and we were doing it by the book um, that God would would come through and show up. So for her to die was a was very hurtful to us. I remember having really uh, conversations with God with an unveiled face for sure. I mean, I really went after him. I was angry. I was dealing with uh, a lot of uh, darkness. I was just frustrated at my faith 
because it seemed to not work. And I really got a dialogue in that moment when I really went after God and God said, you're operating as if you don't understand my victory. When you understand my victory, then you don't mourn as those with no hope. You have to not go away from your training simply because you're facing a trial. And that's what most people do. He said, you asked for your mom to be healed in your prayer. I gave you one better. I healed her eternally. You asked for her to be taken care of. I gave you one better. She's taken care of eternally. You asked for her to have life. I gave you one better. I didn't resuscitate her. I resurrected her. She'll never die again. I gave you what you asked for much greater than what you asked. But because you let your trial be a blindfold to my triumph, you're not seeing the victory clearly. And when he uh, he gave me that understanding, it became a testimony of our faith. It became a testimony of what uh, that this battle that we went through is really was just the precursor to our victory when he gave me that understanding. And that's what people have to understand. And that's what I understood at that time. Well, it's, it's a deeper, you know, kind of gut level understanding of who God is and how he functions with us. You know, so that's tremendous loss. In life, many times people have disappointment. Years ago, you were confronted with another test, the loss of, loss of your NFL career right at the peak. How did you handle that disappointment? Well, again, it's hard. Anytime you're going through it, especially emotionally, um, you're just feeling and sensing um, everything is connected to what you're going through at that time. Again, it becomes a blindfold uh, to what God is actually doing. But I learned, my mom told me this. She said, your greatest ministry will always come out of your greatest misery. And that's why you can't give up. And so when I was getting traded, when I was getting cut, when I was getting carted off the field, um, all of those different things, I was always asking me, why am I going through this? I know I'm good enough to play. I know I'm good enough to be here. This is my dream. This is what I prayed for. But it seems like I'm going through so much to try to get it. And it didn't work out. Um, I, I was on in the league for five years, played on six different teams, could never find a home, um, you know, got sent off to Germany to play in the developmental league. I mean, I was all over the place, uh, hurt, injured, cut, traded, all of those different things uh, with a family, financially struggling because I wasn't um, in the NFL like most people think. So it was a struggle during that time. But as soon as I had my last injury and I went to uh, seminary, uh, because my career was done, I got a call from the Dallas Cowboys and they said, we want you to come back as our team chaplain. And so now I realized that everything that I went through as a player, I had the experience to be even better in the ministry as a chaplain. A player could not tell me anything that I had not experienced myself. And that's when I realized what my mom said is true, that your greatest misery will become your greatest ministry. And God always wanted me to be in the NFL. He just wanted me to be in there his way. <laughs> That's a word right there, isn't it? You and your wife suffered four miscarriages. What did you learn about fighting battles from that? Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, totally out of our control, as you know, uh, miscarriages are. But we had two tr two children, and then we had two miscarriages. Then we had two children, and we had two more miscarriages, and then we had another child. So we have five kids, and it really shows the faithfulness of God in the midst of, of disappointment. But it also taught me... Uh, because after our first two kids, when I came to the third one, me and my wife looked at each other and said, all right, time to have another kid, as if it was up to us. We didn't even talk to God. And sometimes you can have so many victories that you become independent from God and not dependent on God. And it brought our dependency on God back to where it needed to be, because uh, really— it was in his control, not our control, okay? We were not having lookalikes for us. We were having lookalikes for him. And it put us in a position where we realized, you know what? This is for God. Even raising them, we're stewards of it. We're not owners of it. And um, it, it let us know that this battle is higher than we think. Like, we think it's in our control. It's not in our control. It's in his control. And we're just going to come to him. We're going to rest in him. We're going to put the burden on him because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And, uh, and we're still going to plow the field. And so God has blessed us even in the midst of our losses. I want to mention that your book is unique and that it contains a QR code and code every few chapters. What are the codes for? How does that work? Well, we want to walk with you through the book. And so those are videos of me talking about my story and my struggles. Even me and my wife have a section where we talk about our miscarriages, uh, as you just asked. And so we're literally providing community in the book. And so every three chapters, there's a QR code where you can watch a video, watch a testimony that may connect with something you're going through. And so we wanted to make it interactive and we wanted to use technology for the purposes of God. Yeah. 
what's the main takeaway you want readers to wind up with? Yeah, I want to make sure that they know uh, that it's not a time to surrender, that your pit is just a precursor uh, to the palace. And if it's not good yet, God's not done yet. He works all things out for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. He works them out for good. And so don't throw in the towel, because if you throw in the towel or you surrender, then you won't experience who you are, an overcomer, more than a conqueror, delivered, redeemed. That's who you are. We're fighting from victory. We're not fighting for victory. Well, Jonathan's book is called Fighting Your Battles, Every Christian's Playbook for Victory, and it's available nationwide. Jonathan, great to have you with us again today. Bless you. Uh, thank you so much. Taro is a baby living in Cambodia. His mother never takes him outside. Instead, she keeps him hidden in the house. After her baby was born, his mother, Sray Peer, was afraid to show him to anyone. That's because Daro had been born with a cleft palate. I was afraid our neighbors would laugh at him. They asked me why I never took him outside. I lied and said, it's because he's too young. This is Daro's older sister, Sray Carr. At first, I hate how he looked, but later I stopped to love him. When mom fed Daro, he choked and it poured out of his mouth. Oh, no. I want my brother to get an operation. Daro's father tried to save money for the surgery, but because of the COVID pandemic in Cambodia, his motorcycle repair business was suffering. I couldn't sleep at night because my son needed formula to drink. Since the COVID, there has been very little money. I did not even have a way to take him to the hospital. When Operation Blessing learned about their needs, we arranged for Daro to receive free transportation and free surgery at a hospital in the city. That operation was a success. Daro can now eat fruits and drink formula. He gains weight and he never choked again. Daro's father is now back to work and able to provide for the family. To the donors who helped fix my son's lift, I wish you good health and prosperity, and may the COVID stay away from you. Now my brother's lips look great. I can now take my son out every day to visit friends and family. I thank all the donors. My son now has a bright future. That thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, they're praying for you, they're thanking you, they're overjoyed at what you did for them. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. If you're already a member, I encourage you to increase. You can go to 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. We also have 2,500 Club, which is $2,500 a year. Founder, $5,000 or more a year. Whatever level, when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. Bank doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you. Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs or downloads, your choice, uh, where we'll encourage your faith on a monthly basis. All you have to do is ask for Pledge Express when you call or go to CBN.com. When you sign up monthly giving on, on the Internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. We also have something new called Text to Give, where you text the letters CBN to 71777. We want to take some time to answer some of the email questions that you all have sent in. And Gordon, this first one comes from Sabrina, who says, I'm 47 years old and have wasted my life. When I was little, I wanted to do the will of God, but didn't know what it was. I don't want to die without a purpose. When I was 13, I was given a lot of meds. I tried to kill myself because of it. Can I still have a purpose or is it too late for me? I keep asking him, does he hear me or did I fall out of favor? Sabrina, so here's a Bible verse for you. Today is the day of salvation. Let today be the day where you say, the rest of my life, I want to serve the living God. I want to be used by him. It's one of the great prayers. I learned it from my father. You know, Lord, what do you want me to do? Uh, how do you want, how, how can you use me? 
When you pray that on a daily basis, Lord, could you, could you send me to somebody? Could I be a me messenger of your grace and your forgiveness and your love? Can, can you show me who I can pray for? Uh, could you use me today? If you start doing that on a regular basis, some amazing things can happen to you. I've got a story for you. It's a, someone I, I met in China, of all places. Uh, he grew up in Australia. He felt called to China as a missionary back in his teen years. But he, he got convinced, well, that, that's not the way to go. I, I need to go make money first. And so he spent his life in the hotel industry. And did he make money? Yes. But it was it fulfilling? No. He, he, he thought, oh, no, I've, I've missed my life's call. I should have been a missionary all my life. Well, God spoke to him and said, well, you can still do it. Isn't that great? You can still do it. And so here he was in his 60s, and he said, well, I'm now going to be a missionary. And when his idea was, I'm going to go to college in China. So he became a student in China. The other students called him the favored elder, uh, and they listened to him because the Chinese culture honors those who are older. And uh, he, he had a tremendous ministry. He was starting Bible studies in China and living a life of joy. You can have that. You can have a life of joy. You can have a life of purpose. You can have a life of fulfillment. Just ask God daily. This is Sharon who says, my friend is a Muslim. She's insisting that I come to her mosque. I am a Christian, a child of God. Should I go to the mosque? Um, th this is a very personal decision. I have been to mosques. Um, uh, I've actually have been inside the Dome of the Rock. As a Christian, you can't go there anymore. Um, but back, you know, in, in the late 60s and 70s, I was able to go inside and uh, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, I've been in mosques in Indonesia. I've been in mosques in the Philippines. Uh, so I'm not going to say don't go to a mosque. The issue for you is are you violating your conscience? So uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Uh, if you are, are wondering, is it okay? There's a prayer that I made before I went into a Hindu temple way back in 1994. Lord, is it okay? It was amazing what he said to me. Yes, uh, I'll protect you. Uh, I want to show you some things. And in that, some revelations came to me that were absolutely phenomenal. If your friend wants you to go, it's showing that your friend wants to share her faith with you. And what that does is open up a door where you get to share your faith with her. Isn't that great? <laughs> where you, you can talk to her. And one of the great weaknesses, if you will, of Islam is nobody knows if they're saved. Uh, you can talk to her. Well, I, I know a Savior who loves you, who can forgive all your sins, who wants to promise you eternity with him, where you can rest and be assured of your salvation. It might be an open door for you. Here's a word from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. May God bless you. We'll see you again on Monday.